It's a blessing to be used by you. And I thank you that you are speaking to me as you speak to your people. You're speaking through, through me to myself. And I want to thank you for what you are doing in this church. I want to thank you for blessing us and holding us together. I want to thank you for the leadership that you have put around me here. The, the ministers that you put here. I want to thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, today, uh, I'm feeling kind of, God is leading me into something that he's never done this to me before, to take uh, the same scripture that I used last time. And, uh, but he's doing so. He used the same, the same scripture that I, that I used a couple of weeks when I was up here. And uh, I want you to know that uh, I don't want to be sound redundant or repetitive, but I'm going to be saying some of the same things that I said last time. But uh, God, is, God has, to, has told me many times that I don't have to apologize for anything he tells me to do. Even though I, I have had to, I have done so on occasions here. But um, I'm asking you to open up our hearts this morning, Father, and receive what you are saying. I know you're stressing what you said last, last time. We're still looking at the book of Romans. You'll probably hear some of the things that you heard last, the last, last week. But that's all right anyway. Let's remember of all the, we're talking about uh, the book of Romans, of all the churches, remember that uh, Paul wrote letters to the church at Rome was not established by Paul. In fact, he'd never been to that ministry. He had never. Yet, he shows the right arm power of the Holy Spirit who knows exactly what we all need. Even though he had never been to Rome in that church, he knew what was needed. Paul, God told him to, what to say. He had, had uh, Paul had uh, founded all the churches uh, around the Mediterranean, like Philippi and Corinth and Ephesus and uh, Colossae and uh, Thessalonica and Galatia, but it's accepted that a group of Christians gathered in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost went back and uh, founded that church in Rome. Now the Roman church and Paul shared a mutual admiration and respect. The Roman church was familiar with Paul and his reputation as one who not only persecuted Christians, but actually had many put to death. In fact, when Stephen, remember, when he was stoned to death, the word tells us that right in the middle of that mob stood a young man named Saul, who later was Paul. He was right in the middle of it when Stephen was, was uh, rocked to death, <laughs> stoned. And this same Paul was miraculously converted to Christianity and came its greatest, became his greatest spokesman other than Jesus himself. It's hard to think that a man as bad as Paul was would eventually write about 25% of the New Testament. Isn't that something? Mm. Paul had a great respect for the Roman church who maintained itself 
in the front yard of Caesar and the Roman government. Paul said in the first, first chapter that uh, your faith is well known throughout. He was talking to that church in Rome. And it was amazing to think that that was even a church in Rome. But Roman, it was, you know, it was Roman soldiers that arrested Jesus to be crucified. He stood in a Roman court before Pilate. He was hung on a Roman cross. Rome was a great enemy to the church. And here this church is thriving and shouting hallelujah to Jesus in Caesar's front yard. The Roman emperor is hearing their shouting and praising and speaking in tongues morning, noon, and night. Now that took faith to stand there right in front of Caesar and, and have your church doing that. But even though Paul admired the church and had never been there, he didn't hesitate to caution them quite roughly, telling them that, that only bodies that are holy are acceptable, acceptable to God's uses, usage. You know, we are back to our own vision that God gave us. He said, what do you tell us? Be ye holy, because I, your God, am holy. Isn't that what he said to us? All right, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 12. Let's look at the first verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you put, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what he said. Excuse me, this, um, you know, I'm going to be, y'all going to have to buy me a new pulpit. And I'm, I'm serious. I, and I want another one, a bigger one than this. He tells us just because you decide you want to do some church work does not mean you're acceptable to God. Paul said, present your bodies holy and acceptable to, acceptable to God for service. But it's in verse 2 that he actually tells us how to become holy and acceptable. Read verse 2. Somebody read that for me. 12. Hmm. Thank you. Let me, let me repeat. Paul admired and respected the faith of this church. Faith to remain committed right in the glare of the Christian-hating government of Caesar. He tells this church that their faith is known and is spoken of in all parts of the world. In chapter 10... He tells them of his admiration for their zeal. However, church, faith and zeal are not enough. Church, you can't find any more zeal and energy for things of God than you find in a newborn Christian. You know, they come running, ready to do something needed in the church, but it doesn't take much to take that zeal away from them. Because they don't hang around and be taught. We have a great teaching going on here every Sunday morning. How many people do you think come? They don't come. You, you don't. You got to hunger for the word. He got special teachers in here. He sent them here, but they don't come. They don't come to Bible study and be taught God's word. So Satan can easily. Infiltrate all that zeal and remind them of the good times that they used to have. Remember how good that dope made you feel? You're forgetting how, how good she was in the bed. Uh -huh. Remember how gra gratifying it was to cuss somebody out who was speaking bad of you? Remember how it, good, how it felt when you got a chance to cuss them out? Hmm.
Paul is talking to the Roman church as well as abiding love church to present yourself holy and righteous if you want to be acceptable to God. In chapter 8, Paul tells them, all things work out for the good for those called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? His purpose is to be holy. That's his purpose for us. Do you know that? He's not simply calling for people. He, he's calling for a certain kind of people. Righteous people. Uh, read Romans, Romans 3, 12, 3. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. As we digest this verse, we see how Paul often says the same things uh, to many of the other churches. That means God is stressing certain things to us today. The apostle told the Philippian church to esteem others better than yourselves. I'm sure you remember last time I was ordered to reveal some unrighteousness about myself. I was hoping we could skip that this time. But he has ordered me to go further. Remember I told you how I thought I was somebody special when I was the best in my music class in at Cal State? Well, today I'm going to tell you how, how I was on my high horse in the church itself. I was a saved and spirit-filled minister of music. And I wrote, began to write cantatas for the choir. For choir, soloists, and a full orchestra. Our church, I wrote every note for each orchestral instrument. as well as for the organist. And I began to strut and pat, pat myself on the back. I said, how many choir directors can do what you have done? Church, I wrote five full cantatas, and God truly anointed them. I often wanted to use them in our service, but God would not, all, well, he would always stop me. I didn't understand why, because he definitely had anointed them. But he told me, and when he did tell me, it didn't, didn't, didn't feel good. He said to me, Pastor Carl, even though I poured my anointing in them, you would not emphasize my anointing. You lift yourself up in pride. And I love you too much to allow you to, to allow your pride to destroy you. You know, God said in the book of Prophets, pride comes before destruction. Didn't he say that in Proverbs? Then he opened up something to me that I had not fully grasped. And I'm certain that many of our teachers here maybe did get that, but I hadn't. And uh, he told me when I was swollen up about my own musical accomplishments, he said, Carl, whatever gift you have, I gave it to you. Every good and perfect gift comes from me. So you can't boast about it. Also, he said, if it didn't come from me and you gave it to yourself, you still can't boast about it because whatever you gave is not good and perfect. So you still can't boast about it. I don't care how beautiful it is, I still, it is still imperfect and unworthy of any praise. See, church, I needed a new transformation. Because as long as I was boasting in my gift, I was only conforming to, conforming to holiness. I wasn't being transformed. He reminded me of what uh, he reminded me of what Prophet Amos said to Israel. He said, "Take away the noise of your songs." He said, "I don't want to listen to them." He said, "I'll stop my ears up. I won't even listen to your music." He said, "I don't want music. I want righteousness." He said. Uh, 
He told, he told me, Pastor, there's nothing righteous about you strutting around in pride. And I thank God I received that. But he, he has given me permission to use some of my cantatas right here sometimes. But he had to, you know, had to calm me down. He had to mess with me because I was messing with myself. You know, it's something when you think you're somebody. Uh, look at yourself. You ain't nobody. You are nobody except what God said. What God has made you, and if God made you, you still can't boast in it. You can only boast for him. And if you made it, you made yourself, it's not worth boasting in. I don't care how pretty it is. I want to thank you this morning for your word. Thank you. I don't know what I'm saying.